Hello, how are you all? Did you have a nice week? I hope you did. Tonight, I continue to pray to the Lord that you will be blessed with His love, and that you feel the joy of His salvation, and His grace and peace while living in this imperfect world. We are already into the second half of the book of Exodus. And this half is about the wilderness tabernacle or sanctuary. It is a detailed instruction from God to Moses to how to build it and how to implement it for services, for worship. And in between the instruction, there was a story about worship of the golden calf. And it tells you why it happened. And there are several points to study about tabernacle, and I'll mention this briefly. The first point, the tabernacle or sanctuary is a place of meeting. It remained very important throughout the history of Israel because it is closely related to the covenant. You notice from Genesis until now, we observe God likes to make covenant with his people. And within this covenant relationship, we see God was very close to his people. And his close relationship was essential for us, for his people, because sinful and weak human beings constantly need his presence for instruction, for guidance, for provision, for protection, for life. And the main purpose of the sanctuary was to provide a particular place for God to dwell among them, the Israelites. In fact, the Hebrew term for tabernacle means tent or hut. It implies dwell, place of rest to live in. And it is related to Shekinah. Shekinah means God's glorious presence. You see, God loves his people so much that he would dwell in a tent just to be with them. And we know that thousands of years later, as Messiah, he became human and dwell among us. John 1, 14. Second point about the tabernacle. It is about redemption and covenant. Before the building of the sanctuary, there was a divine act of redemption. They did not do anything to earn this relationship. God delivered them first. You remember that it was they were a slave, they were slaves in Egypt, and God delivered them from slavery. And then after this act of deliverance, God was willing to enter into a permanent relationship with them. And that relationship bind with a covenant. He would be their God and they would become his people. Simply put, the covenant teaches the Israelites the way that they would relate to God and to each other. So, in brief, the tabernacle was a place of meeting, a place where God and human come together. And it was built after God delivered them from slavery. And then a permanent relationship was established through the covenant laws. And this covenant law would teach them how to be God's people and how to worship him and how to treat each other. Third point about the tabernacle. It is about worship and forgiveness of sin. In the tabernacle, there were sacrificial services. And through this sacrifice, the people of Israel would express the love, the gratitude, devotion, and joy to the covenant Lord who dwell among them. In this way, the covenant relationship would be strengthened not only God is the provider, always giving to them, but it allows the people to respond with joy, with gratitude, with thankful heart. 
but also it provides a place for them where they could reconcile with God in case they have violated his covenantal laws. They could find forgiveness of the sin by bringing God a sacrifice. It could be a bull or a lamb. So the sanctuary was also the place where the sin problem was resolved through the blood of the sacrifice and also through the work of the priests on behalf of the people. So when do they perform the ceremony? When do they have all these sacrifices? It was daily, also annually, through the festival, through the different services. So this tabernacle was symbolic and pointing towards God's plan of redemption. And it was all demonstrated out in the New Testament. The tabernacle in Old Testament was a shadow pointing to our Savior, the sinless Redeemer, who came to offer his life as a sacrifice and substitute for the sin of the world. And he, right now, at this point, has become the high priest who ministered in the heavenly sanctuary as a mediator before the heavenly Father. Now let's read chapter 26, starting verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from everyone who sought prompts them to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet, yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins, dye red, and another type of durable leather acacia wood, olive, and for the light spices, and oil, olive oil for the light spices, for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onnet, onnet stones, and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastplate piece. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. The construction of a sanctuary would require the people to provide resources in the form of an offering to the Lord. The items God wanted sounds quite costly. How can the people afford them? Weren't they slaves? So where did their offerings come from? The offerings were probably from the Egyptians. They were given to them while they were leaving Egypt. It was a payback for the years of labor. Let me read to you what it says in Exodus chapter 12, which is like more than 10 chapters prior to this one. It said, The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people and they gave them what they asked for. So God told Moses that he was to receive free will offerings. The verse said, only from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. Offerings then and today are to spring from a thankful and responsive heart. Otherwise, they lack true spiritual value. Part of worship is returning to God a portion of the many blessings that he given us. Every member of the community was in this way a participant in the construction of the sanctuary. The response of the people was so overwhelming that they were restrained from giving more. I mentioned that the offerings were expensive items, gold, silver, bronze, gems, oil, acacia, wood, and spices. In addition, dye, dye for leather, dye for the yarn and the linen cloth. And, and I, I found some interesting facts about color dye. You know, color of red, blue, and purple, they were from uh, mirex, 
is which is a type of snail. And there were abundant of those in the Mediterranean area, you know, in the ocean of Mediterranean. And Phoenician, which is our modern day Lebanon, was renowned for its dyeing industry. And large number of murex shell had been found there from various time periods. Many thousands of snail would have been required to produce the amount of material described here in Exodus. What about the scarlet dye? The scarlet dye probably came from the eggs of an insect that fed on oak trees. So we can see why these items are so expensive. And the people were generous though, right? They were generous to give as offering to God. Now back to the passage. Passage. Again, I would like to ask, why did God want his people to build a tabernacle? You know, from the beginning of time, the time of creation, when God walked into the garden with Adam and Eve, he has always been interested in being close to humans, even dwelling with them. The sanctuary provided the means by which God could dwell among the Israelites. The term tabernacle means dwelling, right? And it points to also the incarnation of Jesus Christ. He become flesh and make his dwelling among us. John 1, 14. And this theme of God's nearness anticipates the new earth that we are looking forward to where God's dwelling and tabernacle will be with his people Revelation 21 3 so while on the mountain God presented Moses with a pattern of the sanctuary and his furnishings and Moses was directed to follow the divine instructions the Hebrew term for pattern can be translated as model or plan. A functional model of the heavenly sanctuary was to be used in the construction of the earthly sanctuary. Let's go to verse 10. Have the people make an ark of acacia wood, a sacred chest 45 inches long, 27 inches wide and 27 inches high. Overlay it inside and outside with pure gold and run a molding of gold all around it. Cast four gold rings and attach them to its four feet, two rings on each side. Make poles from acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to carry it. These carrying poles must stay inside the rings, never remove them. When the ark is finished, place inside it the stone tablet inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Then make the ark's cover, the place of atonement, from pure gold. It must be 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. Then make two cherubim from hammered gold and place them on the two ends of the atonement cover. Mold the cherubim on each end of the atonement cover. Make it all of one piece of gold. The cherubim will face each other and look down on the atonement cover. With their wings spread above it, they will protect it. Place inside the ark the stone tablets inside I mean, sorry, place inside the ark the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Then put the atonement cover on top of the ark. I will meet with you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that hover over the ark of the covenant. From there, I will give you my commands for the people of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was the focal point of the sanctuary, representing the throne of God. 
The ark was made of acacia wood overlaid with gold. And it would contain tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, and eventually also the budding rod of Aaron and a bowl of manna. Above the ark was the mercy seat, the atonement cover, serving as the resting place of the glorious presence of God, or they call the Shekinah. Its position over the ark and the Ten Commandments indicated that mercy and justice are inseparable from each other. Mercy and justice perfectly reflect God's character, isn't it? And thus, the blood sprinkle on the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement, or we call it Yom Kippur, symbolize God's mediation of mercy toward the sinner who had transgressed the law. And the solid gold cherubim stood on either side of the throne of God as guardians of holiness and perfection. And it reflects the heavenly sanctuary where angels minister to God's people on earth. With one set of wings, they cover the bodies representing humility and reverence. And their other wings were raised toward the center above the mercy seat. Now let's read verse 23. Then make a table of acacia wood, 30 inch, 36 inches long, 18 inches wide and 27 inches high. Overlay it with pure gold and run a gold molding around the edge. Decorate it with a three inch border all around and run a gold molding along the border. Make four gold rings for the table and attach them at the four corners next to the four legs. Attach the rings near the border to hold the poles that are used to carry the table. Make these poles from acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Make special containers of pure gold for the table. Bowls, ladders, ladles, pitchers, and jars to be used in pouring out liquid offerings. Place the bread of the presence on the table to remain before me at all time. So what is this table? Well, this is a table where the bread of the presence, or we call it show bread, was placed. This terminology was used because the bread was placed before God in the holy place, just right in front of the mercy seat. As one entered the tabernacle, it would have been on the right side to the north. Like the ark, the table was made of acacia wood covered with hammered gold. Twelve loaves of showbread were set upon the table every Sabbath and were to be eaten by the priests. So what does that mean? The bread represents the 12 tribes of Israel and pointed toward Christ, the mercy seat, and the bread of life. Christ was the bread of life. Now let's move on to verse 32. I mean 31. Make a lampstand of pure hammer gold. Make the entire lampstand and its decoration of one piece. The base center stem, lamb cups, buds, and paddles. Make it with six branches going out from the center stem, three on each side. Each of the six branches will have three lamb cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and paddles. Craft the center stem of the lamb stand with four lamb cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and paddles. There will also be an almond bud beneath each pair of branches where the six branches extend from the center stem. The almond buds and branches must all be of one piece with the center stem, and they must be hammered from gold, pure gold. Then make the seven lamps 
for the lampstand and set them so they reflect the light forward. The lamb snuffers and trays must also be made of pure gold. You will need 75 pounds of pure gold for the lampstand and its accessories. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I've shown you here on the mountain. The lampstand was called a menorah. I'm sure you have seen it in picture. Form from the noun N-E-R, which means light, and N-U-R means to shine or blaze. It was built of solid gold, weighed a talent, means 75 pounds, and was engraved with almond blossom. Why almond blossom? The almond was the first tree to blossom in the springtime, therefore exemplify Christ, the first fruit of the resurrection. Christ was also the light of the world and is represented as standing at the center of the lampstand, whose lamps represented the people of God disseminating his light, Christ's light to the world. The lamp oil symbolized the power of the Holy Spirit to illuminate his truth through the church. So today we talk about the sanctuary, the plan, how to build it. God gave very detailed description of it. And we also have mentioned some of this, you know, uh, furniture, how it points to Jesus Christ, how it points to the plan of salvation. So in summary, I like to uh, point out a few things. Number one, we notice here that, you know, there was uh, great detail, great attention uh, and precision towards how to build this. So the instruction for the tabernacle are highly specific indicate the importance of precision in following God's commands. And this teaches the value of meticulously and care in spiritual and practical matters. Second observation, obedience and faithfulness. The Israelites were expected to follow God's instruction exactly. And this underscores the importance of obedience to God's will and faithfulness in carrying out his command. Third observation, holiness and reverence. The detailed description and the materials used, like gold, silver, fine linen, bronze, etc., reflect the sanctity of the tabernacle. And this signifies the need for reverence and the recognition of the holiness of places and objects dedicated to God. Fourth observation, community and cooperation. Building the tabernacle required a collective effort of the Israelites, highlighting the importance of community and working together to fulfill divine purposes. Fifth observation, provision and generosity. The materials for the tabernacle were provided by the contribution of the people, demonstrating the principles of generosity and stewardship of resources for the work of God. Sixth observation, God's presence among his people. The tabernacle was the dwelling place of God among the Israelites, symbolizing God's desire to be present with his people. This points to the broader theological theme of God's presence and guidance. Seventh observation, symbolism and representation. Each element of the tabernacle has symbolic significance representing various aspects of God's nature and his relationship with his people. 
Understanding these symbols helps in comprehending the deeper spiritual truth conveyed through the physical structure. By reflecting on these lessons, we can gain a deeper appreciation for the spiritual principles underlying the building or the construction of the tabernacle and the relevance to faith and practice today. Happy Sabbath.